Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Ibology. Let's expand our mind. This is a series where we talk about the research into psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature, one study at a time, from past to present. If you'd like to support the show, please rate and review the podcast wherever you can. Today's episode is on the article titled The Fate of Silasin in the Rat, published in 1962. The aim of this study was to better understand part of the pharmacokinetics of psilocin, meaning how psilocin moves through an organism. Specifically, they examined how psilocin was absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract into circulation, how it was then distributed throughout the body, how it was metabolized or broken down, and finally, how it was excreted or removed from the body. In order to track psilocin throughout this process, they used a technique called isotopic labeling. To provide some very brief background, while a single chemical element always contains the same number of protons, the number of neutrons in a given element can vary. For example, carbon-12, which is the most naturally prevalent isotope of carbon, with a natural abundance of 98.93%, contains six protons and six neutrons in the atom's nucleus. By comparison, carbon-14, which is the isotope used in this study, and is also notably rare in nature, making up only about one atom per one trillion carbon atoms, contains six protons and eight neutrons. What's important is that different isotopes of carbon do not substantially differ in their chemical properties, so it's possible that you can replace one isotope for another in a given compound without altering the nature of the compound. This process of switching out one isotope for another is the technique called isotopic labeling or when you are specifically dealing with carbon, it is also called carbon labeling. What's special about replacing carbon-12 with carbon-14 is that carbon-14, unlike carbon-12, is radioactive. This radioactivity allows researchers to trace the movement of a compound through a set of biochemical reactions. One of the ways you can do this is by using what's called a proportional gas counter, which is a device that can measure particles of ionizing radiation in a tissue sample that has undergone a process of wet combustion. This is the method used in this particular study, in order to identify the presence of carbon-14 throughout the process of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Now the researchers made two different labeled forms of psilocin. The first replaced the carbon atom located at position 2 along the side chain that's located off of position 3 on the indole ring. If you happen to be looking at the podcast logo, this is the branch that's located on the upper right-hand side of the molecule, and the carbon that was swapped out would be the black ball just below the gray one, which represents a nitrogen atom. The second labeled form of psilocin replaced a carbon on the same branch, but this time the one shown right above the nitrogen. This carbon is part of one of the two methyl groups attached to that nitrogen. Although the researchers made both forms, They primarily utilized the first one because it was shown to be more metabolically stable. The second form was only used to study a small portion of the metabolic process, specifically the oxidative demethylation of psilocin, which we'll discuss more a bit later in the episode. The last part of the methods I just want to touch on is that for this study, they used male albino rats that were either given 10 milligrams per kilogram of psilocin orally via a stomach tube, or it was injected intravenously. Whether it was given orally, or whether it was injected, this would be the first step in the pharmacokinetic process, called administration. The next step in the process, at least for the rats given psilocin orally, is absorption. And here's where we get into the results of the study. The reason I specify that absorption is specific to rats given psilocin orally is because when you inject the drug intravenously, it bypasses the gastrointestinal tract, or GI tract and is put right into circulation, where it then gets distributed throughout the body, metabolized, and excreted. So for the rats administered psilocin orally, the researchers killed off two at a time after 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, and four hours of being given the drug by draining them of blood. They then took the GI tract from the upper opening of the stomach, called the cardia, to the rectum, and homogenized it in a blender. Radioactivity was then determined using samples of the homogenized GI tract. Now in theory, there should be high amounts of radioactivity in the GI tract initially, and the amount should decrease as psilocin is absorbed and distributed to other tissues. What they found was that at the 30-minute mark, 75% of the total reactivity was in the GI tract. 
followed by 60% after one hour. When they looked at the two and four hour time marks, they found that about 50% of the radioactivity remained in the GI tract, resulting in an apparently asymptotic curve. This indicated that only about 50% of the total psilocin administered orally was actually absorbed through the GI tract of the rats. Now, the remaining measures were all based on rats that were administered psilocin intravenously via injection. Starting with distribution, the researchers killed off pairs of rats at the half, 1, 2, 4, 8, 24, and 48 hour mark after being injected with psilocin. They then created homogenized samples of an array of organ tissue in order to see where, based still on the level of radioactivity, the psilocin was distributed. The researchers found that, in general, psilocin was pretty well distributed across a wide range of tissue just 30 minutes post-administration. However, there were particularly high levels of radioactivity found in order from highest to lowest, the adrenal glands, the kidneys, the salivary glands, the liver, bone marrow, and the stomach. It was, of course, also found in the brain, as well as, in no particular order, the blood, colon, intestines, skin, heart, testes, lungs, spleen, muscle, and thyroid. After one hour post-administration, the levels of radioactivity declined, although stayed particularly high in the kidneys, the adrenal glands, the salivary glands, the liver, and bone marrow, again in order from highest to lowest. By two hours, the level of radioactivity continued to decline, remaining substantially elevated only in the adrenal glands, kidneys, and salivary glands. Radioactivity levels then dropped into the lower range by the four-hour mark and continued to drop over the remainder of the study, confirming the relatively quick elimination of psilocin. Before moving on to the rest of the results, I wanted to note that the researchers actually mentioned that they were surprised by the high levels of radioactivity found in the adrenal glands, and commented that it is an area that deserves further attention. I did a very quick search in PubMed to see if research has been done to follow up examining how psilocin or psilocybin interact with the adrenal glands, and the only thing that I came across, and again this was a very brief search so definitely not exhaustive, was a study that found that psilocybin reduced the amount of noradrenaline in the hypothalamus of rats. Now noradrenaline or norepinephrine is produced in multiple places, but one of them is the adrenal glands, which releases it directly into the bloodstream. I'm not sure if there's a connection there or not, but I agree that it would be an interesting area of future research. So although as psilocin is distributed throughout the body, it also gets metabolized, let's first discuss how the psilocin was excreted from the intact rats. What the researchers found was that after 24 hours, 62% of the radioactive material was excreted in the urine. 21.3% was excreted in the feces, and 6.9% remained in the body of the rats. Interestingly, an additional 2.69% was excreted as carbon dioxide in the expired or exhaled air. At a high level, this shows that psilocin is primarily excreted in the urine via the kidneys and is largely removed from the body one day after administration, although some does remain in the body over several days. Importantly, this doesn't mean someone is still experiencing the psychoactive effects of psilocin. As we just learned from looking at the distribution of psilocin, after only two hours post-administration, it is primarily found in the adrenal glands, kidneys, and salivary glands, not in the brain. In fact, the researchers found incredibly low levels of radioactive material in brain tissue eight hours after administration, and no detectable level of radioactive material 24 hours after administration. Overall though, if you happen to add up the percentages of radioactive material excreted after 24 hours, only about 93% of the total reactivity was accounted for. The researchers hypothesized that an additional 1% may have been lost due to degradation of the side chain in which the carbon-14 isotope was placed, and the remaining 6% may have been lost during sample preparation. Now circling back to the amount of radioactive material in the expired air, what does it mean that 2.69% of radioactive material was found? Well, the authors conclude that it means that about that much psilocin was degraded into indole acetic acid derivatives through a process of oxidative demethylation, which results in the production of carbon dioxide. If we recall back to earlier in this episode, I mentioned that this particular finding was based on the second form of the carbon-14 labeled psilocin. 
Importantly, the second form had the labeled carbon-14 placed in one of the two methyl groups of xylosin, which is how it would end up as part of the carbon dioxide in the expired air. So finally, by examining the composition of the fluids excreted by the rats, the researchers could identify the presence of intact xylosin as well as various metabolites formed during metabolism of the drug. What the researchers found was that intact xylosin, as well as 4-hydroxyindole-3-acetic acid, accounted for approximately 40% of the excreted radioactive material. The remaining material they noted was in a form of a hydrophilic metabolite, although they could not definitively determine that the products were glucuronides, which are a common type of hydrophilic metabolite. Based on what we know now, it was likely that what they found was in fact xylosin o glucuronide. Essentially, there is an enzyme in the liver and small intestine that links xylosin with glucuronic acid, which makes the new compound more water-soluble and allows it to be eliminated through the urine and feces. So just to summarize some of the key highlights, 50% of orally administered xylosin is absorbed through the intestines, where it is then distributed fairly widely throughout the body and eliminated relatively quickly, although with some metabolites still being excreted seven days after administration. Xylosin is predominantly eliminated via the kidneys as urine, and the majority is excreted as either intact xylosin, 4 hydroxyindole 3 acetic acid, and xylosin O glucuronide. Well, that's it for today's episode. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the podcast, please let me know. You can find out all the ways to reach me on the website, silocybology.org, where you can also find the full transcript for each episode if interested. Thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.